Their waters have been dammed, their banks raised, their channels narrowed, and their paths straightened. And the Great Flood of 93 served as a reminder that their force remains untamed. Hi, I'm Kip Woods with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Since the days of Lewis and Clark and stories of Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, the Mississippi and Missouri rivers have played a big role in Missouri's heritage. But some aspects of these waterways remain a mystery. During the next half hour, we'll try to shed some light on these murky waters and learn more about Missouri's big rivers. We'll see what's being done to restore the endangered pallid sturgeon to these waters. Then, discover why these tiny mussels are creating big problems around the Great Lakes and how they're muscling in on Missouri. Also, we'll take a journey downstream and see what changes are taking place both in the water and on the banks of the Mississippi. But first, the Great Flood of 93. Its force destroyed homes and lives. It also created new ones. See how blue holes could reveal some important clues for reclaiming the land along this raging river. It's next on Missouri Outdoors Big River Special. is a raging animal, flowing backwards and over, forcing everyone out of its way. It come out of, the, out of nowhere just to help. That's going to be probably at the top of the bags, and I don't know if we've got enough strength underneath the hole. This is a, a gone crop year, and uh, we just hope the weather patterns get back to normal. The consolidated North County Levee District advised that it will not be able to hold the levee. It would be a shame to lose approximately 40,000 acres. Homes folks worked hard to achieve and keep up. And now it's all in a war. The Great Flood of 1993 ravaged the Missouri River Valley, destroying homes, devastating croplands, and shattering lives. The river reclaimed its natural floodplain, and despite the staggering damage, the passage of time may prove that the flood left more than high water marks. The floodwaters receded to reveal hundreds of shimmering blue holes dotting the river basin. Generally they're associated with breaks in the levee. When water started going over the levee or through the levee, it starts a scouring action and once it, once it starts digging down, then it just starts eating down and lifts it up and creates these big holes and it's just amazing the power that water has. A lot of these blue holes are in fact deeper than the river, so it's just pretty amazing. The vast number of blue holes gives researchers an unparalleled view of the creation of new habitats, including wetlands. We're actually comparing these blue holes to some natural wetlands that occur along the Missouri River and other areas. You know, we don't know in, in all cases what created those, whether those areas started out as blue holes as a result of a flood or whether they were just natural basins that, that occurred there. The Missouri Department of Conservation organized researchers from five federal agencies and two state universities to collaborate on the Missouri River Research Project. During the next three years, researchers will study every aspect of the blue holes, from the number and species of invertebrates. We have um, 
moths and flies and midges just in, within this one sample. To the water birds that feed on them. Each week, a team takes to the skies to inspect 70 sites along the river. We can look at the bird use from a very large scale and compare all these different sites along the river, looking at how important these scours are or these newly created wetlands are to the water bird community. And not only are we looking at the bird community associated with this, but we're also looking at the impacts of the basin. How are these changing vegetatively? Uh, how are the levees being put in? Where are they being put in? We're able to sort of come back a little bit with aerial surveys and look at a larger, more of a landscape view as opposed to just a, a site-specific look. Migratory shorebirds have discovered the Blue Holes as the perfect rest stop on their journey from the north to South America. During their, these migrations, these wetlands like this are extremely important for them to gain energy reserves to continue flying. They're stopping off, filling, basically refueling like we do in a car, and filling up with, with a lot of fat so they can continue to, to fly. Researchers believe that fish are also benefiting from the calm waters. There are a lot of species of fish, riverine fish, that, that spawn in these off-channel floodplain habitats. The second thing is that they provide food um, because there's a very high density of young fish here. And we don't know about the third one, whether they may provide refuge during the winter months or whether they're providing refuge from the high velocity that occurs in the main channel. The blue holes are getting a lot of fishing pressure so that there's a lot of people have discovered them and are going out and fishing and they're catching, uh, I think, good numbers of catfish. I think they're probably finding that there are crappie in these things that, they, that don't normally occur here. And uh, it should just be a better uh, fishing situation for, for those that, that use the river. Blue cat, 901. See a big fella? Let's go over there. Yeah. Okay. What I hope will happen is that these areas will, will remain low enough that we can get water into them uh, every spring, every high water period. If that happens, then the fish populations of the river will, will improve. It will be a very good situation for them. If these areas fill up and become unusable, we're not going to be much better off than we were uh, before the flood. Much of the land in the floodplain will never be the same. Graduate students are studying what types of vegetation are replacing the crops on the once fertile farmland. Some landowners are placing their acreage into the Emergency Wetland Reserve Program. This ensures that severely damaged land will be allowed to return to its natural state. By providing these additional habitats, we may be able to increase some of these populations of, let's say, sport fish and also provide other opportunities such as hunting and fishing on these areas. For some, the legacy of the raging floodwaters will be the heartache and disaster. But in time, we may also find a legacy of new wildlife along Missouri's Great River. After the 93 flood, the federal government instituted the Emergency Wetland Reserve Program. It gave qualifying landowners an opportunity to sell their flood damaged acreage. In turn, it's giving the rivers more room to roam, something they haven't had in some time. During the past 70 years, river engineers have worked furiously on the Missouri River. Dikes and levees were built, and the river's channel dredged to provide a water highway for the commercial towing industry. As a result of the narrowing and straightening, over 100,000 acres of the publicly owned river have been converted to the privately owned floodplain. Levees were also built along the bank of the river, walling out the floodplain. The water simply has no place to go but up. The Great Flood of 93 was the fourth major flood in 20 years. From it, we learned many things. Most importantly, while Mother Nature caused the flood, humans caused the damage. Many agree it's time to work with nature, not against it. We must get out of its way or get wet. 
Coming up, see how efforts are helping this prehistoric looking fish to swim in Missouri waters once again. It's an up close look at the endangered pallid sturgeon next on Missouri Outdoors Big River Special. Back when the earth was young, a large scaly fish called the pallid sturgeon glided along the bottoms of the big rivers, the Missouri and the Mississippi. Today, a recovery team is trying to save this unusual fish from extinction. When the pallid sturgeon recovery team met uh, the first time, we decided that if we didn't do something for the pallid sturgeon within 10 years, it was probably going to be extinct. There are very few pallid sturgeon left in the river. So it's something that we can't sit back and, and devise projects and uh, wait for money and wait 10 years to start. We've got to get going immediately. A federal agency declared the pallid sturgeon an endangered species in 1990. The Missouri Department of Conservation took up the challenge of artificially spawning and raising pallid sturgeons, a task never successfully tried until 1992. Breeding and raising the pallid was only half the battle. During the 70s, researchers recorded a large number of fish which resembled a cross between the pallet and the shovel-nosed sturgeon. I think one of the most important problems that we've had is distinguishing the pallets from the hybrids. To help verify the brood stock as purebred pallets, team members took muscle, blood, and tissue samples for testing. 742. In 1994, more than 7,000 pallets were stocked into the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. I'm really excited uh, about those initial stockings because we have already to date received almost 30 reports of those fish being captured by either sport fishermen or commercial fishermen. All of those fish were tagged, uh, tagged with an external tag that's easy identifiable by fishermen and then we put a coated wire tag into the fish that will last an uh, entire lifetime. And everyone is telling me that these fish are just beautiful shapes, so it, it's indication to us that survival of that entire 7,000 fish was probably rather high, which we had hoped it would be. That's really a nice pallid sturgeon. Graham considers the return of the pallids to the shovel. big rivers as a first step in a 10 to 15 year plan. That's a great fish right here. Yeah. New technology, such as radio telemetry, may prove to be the next step in saving this prehistoric fish. All right. Here we go. By putting those transmitters in individual fish, we can track them and find out what kind of habitats they use in the spring versus summer or fall or winter, or we can find out what kind of habitats they use in the daytime versus nighttime. And that's very important for us because right now we know they live in a river, period. We have no idea what kind of habitats they use uh, for finding food, for resting, or even for reproducing. We've got to take care of those kinds of fish because they're part of the history of the United States and of the big rivers. We don't want to see those fish disappear. While the pallid sturgeon population has struggled to survive in recent years, there's another underwater species that's growing in numbers, but they're not welcome guests. They may be tiny, but they're making a big impact, and their invasion into the Show Me State has begun. Tiny? Yes. Unassuming? Definitely. Harmless? Absolutely not. It could be one of the most destructive invaders ever seen in Missouri. What it lacks in size, it makes up for in sheer numbers. Zebra mussels are small, about an inch long mussel with um, alternating light and dark stripes on the shell. They came from Eastern Europe in the mid-1980s. They were first discovered in the Great Lakes in about 1988 and have since spread throughout the Mississippi River. They will reach relatively high numbers in three to five years in some of our streams, and they will start being a serious problem for water users because they will plug intake pipes, and unless those pipe systems are treated, they will cut off water supplies. They may eliminate native mussels as they have done in the Great Lakes and some of these other rivers. Zebra mussels reproduce quickly, attach to any hard surface underwater, even each other, and colonize up to six inches deep Careful monitoring shows they're only beginning to muscle in on Missouri. The first thing we're going to do is check 
the blocks here for zebra mussels. And we'll do that just by looking at them and also by feeling them. Okay, we got a zebra mussel right here. The zebra mussels don't look like any of our native mussels. They've got the pattern of zigzag lines on the side and they've got a flat, totally flat edge. Anything clinging to the monitors is preserved for later study to see if the mussel's microscopic larvae are present. Zebra mussels seem to be accomplished at playing hide and seek with the people watching for them. But history proves they are here somewhere, and that means native mussels are at risk. We are brailing in several areas in the Mississippi River trying to determine what our native populations of mussels are. Very little has been done in this area with native mussels, and we need to know what we've got in case the zebra mussels or some other factor starts to influence our native populations. This newest threat to native mussels and river-based industries will continue until a way is found to control zebra mussel populations. There are some animals that eat them, but there are no known effective human-made controls. One of the things we are doing is trying to get the word out to the public through brochures, et cetera, to try to keep them from transplanting zebra mussels from one place to another. Even before they're visible to the human eye, zebra mussels can be hitchhiking on your boat. If you've been in infested water and your hull feels grainy to the touch, wash it with hot water and soap. Emptying live wells and bait buckets on dry land also helps slow the spread. Well, it's basically up to fishermen and other water users to keep them from getting into some of our other waters because the way they get transplanted from one place to another is on boats, fishing tackle. I don't know what kinds of things we'll do when it becomes more of a problem. And right now, they're elsewhere, but people in other states are telling us you're going to have them just like we are, and they're going to be a huge problem, and you're going to wish you did something sooner. So that's what we're trying to do, is do something now. Just ahead, how do the natural and man-made changes in the Mississippi River affect the water quality, fish, and plant life? That's what a special project near Cape Girardeau is trying to find out. It's the long-term resource monitoring program on the Mississippi, next on Missouri Outdoors Big River Special. Mississippi River, a vein of life in America's heartland, a precious resource that must be studied if it is to survive. One such study became a reality when Congress mandated the Environmental Management Program in the 1980s, and six research stations sprung up along the upper Mississippi River system. The Long-Term Resource Monitoring Program is actually a study in ecology. In this program, we are trying to bring together the fisheries, the water quality, and the vegetation aspects of the river and how it integrates into one giant database so that we can better manage this system. The Cape Girardeau Field Station, the farthest south, studies the area 25 miles north and south of town. The river itself is magnificent, and in a lot of ways it's a dinosaur. And we're being given a real opportunity to view a, a habitat and a, a living system that is in jeopardy in a lot of different respects. The water quality team collects samples for chemical and physical tests of specific sites in the study area year round. Samples are taken from the river bottom as well, so biologists can look at the entire picture each test brings the project closer to its goal. The ultimate goal of this program is that after 10 years, we hope that we will be able to provide recommendations to make the Mississippi River compatible for both navigation and for recreational uses. Fisheries biologists work the river and its backwaters for their research on fish communities. To collect over 50 species of fish, a variety of nets and methods are used. Day fades into night, and the fisheries team is still on the job, this time in electric fishing boats, temporarily stunning fish along the banks and backwaters to collect more information. Data from all six stations goes to a central location, 
so resource managers can make informed decisions about the future of the Upper Mississippi. The third team of the study is the vegetation crew. They not only look at existing forest and surrounding plant life, they also explore possible solutions to restore lost habitat. The Upper Mississippi River is an endangered species, if you will. Since the mid-1800s, it has been altered to suit man's needs and to suit a growing navigation industry. We've only recently begun to realize that the river has more importance than that, that not only can we use it for commerce, but we can also use it for recreation. It's also very important to our natural heritage. And many of those associated resources with the river have rapidly been depleted or degraded to the point where they're no longer producing fish and wildlife and the other values that we hold so dear. These biologists and botanists believe their activities will make the difference. Because the more we know about the river system, the better our chances of preserving it for the future. Missouri's big rivers are more than bodies of water racing downstream. For one prehistoric looking fish, they're a home. For a tiny invading mussel, they're a highway. And for those that have battled their rising waters, they're a reminder that we may be getting too close to the water's edge. Missouri's big rivers, they're like wild bulls. They can't be tamed. The best one can do is share their world for a while. <laughs>